Well, hello and welcome to our Accenture San Francisco office. My name is Natasha Sunderjee. I am the Global Health and Nutrition Lead for Accenture Development Partnerships. I also lead Accenture's Health Equity Center of Excellence. But I'm really proud to say I am a board member of the Bay Area for the Health Alliance. And on behalf of the Alliance, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event. Um, the Bay Area Global Health Alliance is a membership organization and network hub that tries to unite different sectors as we try to foster improvements in global health, innovation, and equity. It includes over 85 world-class member organizations across sectors, including academia, technology, private sector, startups, foundations, public institutions, and the not-for-profit sector. For the many guests here tonight that are not part of the Alliance, I encourage you to seek out members of the Alliance. Many of them have the name tag in plastic. Ask them questions, get to know us a little bit more. It's a great way to connect to folks that share your passion for global health. Now, tonight's agenda for our reception builds on the theme that we began to explore at the J.P. Morgan uh, conference panel that was held immediately before this, reimagining healthcare. We're honored to have special guests with us tonight, Dr. Raj Punjabi, uh, who's joining us for our fireside chat. So without further ado, let me pass the mic to Krista Donaldson, another Alliance board member and the Director of Innovation to Impact at the Stanford Buyer Center for Biodesign, who will be facilitating tonight's discussion. Thank Thanks, you. Natasha. And I also uh, want to thank Accenture and Natasha for hosting us here tonight. So thank you. So welcome uh, to a conversation with Raj. I'm going to make a few quick remarks. Raj doesn't know this, but um, we actually go way back. We were uh, fellows together in the Malago Foundation when we were young, <laughs> naive, <laughs> global health entrepreneurs. Um, I like they said more here. <laughs> And we, I think I had less gray hair, but anyway, um, it's it's such a pleasure to interview him. And I'm gonna give him, I'm gonna read a proper introduction of him. Um, so for those of you who are, weren't at J.P. Morgan, you can understand the incredible background and experience Raj brings, and will bring to this conversation, I'm sure, as well. Um, so, <clears throat> all right, one of Time's 100 most influential people in the world. Sorry, I, have to, I only I laugh because my wrong. kids my kids laugh for the same. <laughs> Raj Punjabi is a renowned physician, entrepreneur, and former White House official. Dr. Punjabi served as the White House Senior Director leading the pandemic and biological threats um, office for President Biden at the National Security Council. He played a pivotal role in the largest global vaccination campaign in history against COVID-19 and numerous infectious disease outbreak responses. He oversaw White House efforts to prevent the next pandemic, including playing a leading role in implementing the National Biodefense Strategy, American Pandemic Preparedness Plan, President's Executive Order on Advancing Biotechnology and Biomanufacturing, and the U.S. Global Health Security Act. Raj also led the U.S. President's Malaria Initiative. I'm not sure if you slept or not. By the way, um, he is now an entrepreneur in residence at the Emerson Collective. He's a co founder of Last Mile Health, which is how I met him. And originally, Last Mile was called, remind me. It was a local name in the letter dialect, Tiat Time, which means truth or justice. There you go. Um, and, you know, just to connect the dots, um, for those of you who weren't at JP Morgan, he was named at Times List because of the fearless response from Last Mile Health to the Ebola epidemic in 2014 2016. Um, in addition, he's currently also on the faculty of Harvard Medical School for Women and Women's Hospital, um, and he's also been listed twice, 50 Greatest Leaders by Fortune, um, one of times 50 Most Influential People in Healthcare, and he's won the TED Prize, the Clinton Global Citizen Award, the School Award for Social Entrepreneurship, and the World Economics Forum Social Entrepreneur of the Year. Thanks. Um, I'm so thrilled. Uh, but what are, I want to start you off too. You have had so much experience in these different sectors, and also I'm going to claim a little credit too in that you were one of the, I think, the first social entrepreneur in the White House to have that kind of position. But my question for you is like these different experiences. Like, what are you most proud of, and like, how did you bring them, you know, to your work and to your passion? Well, it's great to be here, everybody. What am I most proud of? I, Look, I'm, I'm, I think the, the work that most, in the most recent chapter with the 
the White House the, the work to, to vaccinate uh, you know, both here and around the world, I feel proud of for a couple of reasons. One, one is uh, I was actually vaccinating people in the Boston area after being one of the first few health workers to get vaccinated. And that was in January 21. And even the first six months I was with the administration, I was side hustling with permission from the federal government. Uh, you need security clearance for that. Right, <laughs> exactly. Uh, going out to, uh, to you know, town squares, community centers in Chelsea, Massachusetts, where vaccines are being given not in hospitals, but in cultural education centers. And these places that have been you know, homes for these community members now have then lost their jobs because of the pandemic. They were, a lot of them were essential workers. Uh, you know, those are the places that actually help get us to this place with COVID where uh, it is not over, to be clear, but it is no longer an emergency in the way it was. And what the reason I feel proud about is not just what we in the White House did or didn't do. It is because of community centers like La Calabatiba, the one I was mentioning, that actually brought care to people. And you, I think here in the Bay Area, you see the same thing. I think for all of us interested in global health, have known for a long time that if communities lead a response, if communities in public health are not the objects of change, but the agents in it, uh, that's something we all see every single day in this work. And I see it in Liberia where I grew up. And to see that be so pivotal in helping us get to a place we were in this response, I think to me is something I feel we're proud of. And a lot of folks in the White House actually continue, including the President's Chief of Staff, Jeff Sines, who was the COVID response coordinator. You know, one of the stories he talks about is the fact that a thousand barbershops in this country helped do vaccinations for uh, for African American men, and and and, then and how did that come about? Like, tell us a little bit more about that too, because I think that's a really interesting example of going to the community and understanding where the community is going, and yeah, maybe trust in the community as well. Well, I, look, I, I think it came about in this particular response here in the U.S. Uh, in part because we saw what we always see with pandemic responses. There are gaps between basically pandemics as we know are just migrate across the fault, fault lines we already have in our healthcare system and there are low income uh, communities there are uh, racial groups in this country that are that are often out of reach the places and pockets in this country where that work has been a, a focus bringing care to people not waiting to come to care those end up becoming the bright spots that everyone else followed along. So the barbershop is a great example. The University of Maryland had been working uh, to, some of you will know this effort, uh, to train uh, barbers to educate and, and help African-American men in particular, who, who, uh, in that particular community where uh, you know, we're in those barbershops, to, to actually uh, learn about high blood pressure and cardiovascular health. Uh, so the pivot to COVID vaccination became something possible. And I think the fact that those folks ended up getting lifted up during this response uh, is vital. Now, we, we are at a place following the pandemic where we had the greatest you know, reversal in life expectancy, uh, both in this country and around the world that we've had since World War II. So we now need to double down on that community-based approach uh, as part of a broader healthcare reform that we, that we need to do. So uh, that's, that's how it came about, Krista. It's, it, was, it was those innovations at that scale um, and you know look 650 million vaccinations got in people's arms we still have more work to do with the booster here we've got more work to do around the world uh, you know there's nothing like a routine adult immunization program in a lot of the poorest countries and it's certainly not the place i grew up it turns out there are people there who are at risk for the next variant of covid the current one influenza and then just a whole host of everyday epidemics that affect people that aren't necessarily infectious diseases this, this makes me want to ask more questions, of course, Raj, but I also think, too, about last month's health response with Ebola, too, and then you in this role in the White House. And are there specific things from your experience in Liberia? And, you know, and I'm not sure people do know about your childhood, so maybe you could share a little bit about that as well. Uh, but, you know, that prepared you and made you think about 
prioritizing th certain things with the pandemic response here in the US? Well, in some of you will have likely been involved with it, or has come to be known as history's worst evil outbreak. And in in 2014, really late 2013, uh, there was a little boy named Emil who died with uh, vomiting fever and diarrhea. Weeks later, his sister and his mother who were caring for him died uh, in the forest of Southern Guinea, uh, rainforest area that, uh, and because there's a dearth of clinics, a dearth of labs, a dearth of health workers, you had what ended up being detected as the Ebola virus, not get detected for what it was three months. By then, the virus had spread like wildfire. We had been working at Last Mom Health in Liberia because many of us who had lived in the country had come back after the Civil War to see if we could serve the people that had been uh, there recovering after conflict. And so we've already been working in Liberia, one of the most affected countries. Some 11,000 people went on to die from this disease, and almost 30,000 people were infected with it. And this was before we had an Ebola vaccine. And so the, the response was, uh, frankly, late. Uh, some of the same things we saw with COVID happened. It was the poorest people. It was the most marginalized populations who were not getting healthcare in Liberia's case, it was rural people who were not uh, having access to treatment or having access to health workers or tests. And so um, importantly, the health workers were getting sick and think about our experience during COVID here in the US. And the health workers, after the war, there was such a few number of them, 51 doctors for a country of 4 million people. Be like San Francisco having just eight physicians, ten physicians for the entire city. We probably have eight more than eight physicians in this room, are we not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. And so so imagine then if one out of ten of those remaining post-war health workers die from an infection, how terrified you'd be. I remember sitting in a rainforest in October of 2014 with trying to train some of these workers and seeing the fear in their eyes uh, because they knew that some of their fellow health workers would die, and they got infected, they would die because they didn't have a vaccine. And yet, they stepped up to respond much in the same way health workers here did. Community health workers and community nurses were critical because, again, it meant going door to door to learn the symptoms and signs of Ebola. And they're not again. recognized enough, nurses in the community and the community health workers too. I that's right. Yeah, and, and you know that's starting to change in some places, but if you look at the data around the world, community health workers, as many who here have worked with them, sort of people who often aren't even high school educated, they're trained, equipped in a few weeks uh, with, with to do you know basic medical care. So I have to jump off on that too because uh, Michelle Berry, I don't know if you see Michelle Berry from Stanford, knew I was interviewing you. She's a, also a big fan of Roger. She's like, ask Roger why we don't have community health workers in the U.S. <laughs> so and I know we do in some places. But well, it's actually one of the things. It was actually one of the things that I feel deeply grateful to CNS. So those of you, uh, I, I was talking to a couple of individuals involved with. Humana and, and, and I'm sure others here are involved in health equity and also in primary health care delivery in this country. Well, it turns out that after COVID, uh, CMS recognizing in part, both two things. Number one, that if you invest in hiring training Americans that look like the communities they serve, it is it makes sense from set perspective saving lives, advancing quality, but also saving money. Shreya can go be and others have done work showing that uh, you, you could save uh, dramatic sums of dollars in Medicaid and Medicare implementation by reducing hospitalizations, by getting the people earlier in their disease course, and those who are sick, keeping them out of the hospital and providing care in a continuum from primary care clinics to homes. So here's the big change that happened. In July, First Lady uh, Jill Biden announced that the Centers for Medicare Services would, for the first time in the U.S. history, reimburse community health workers in this country. Uh, it's, it's worth the clap. Yeah. Maybe in terms of this multi-directional learning we're having, a long overdue. 
Well, if you talk to someone like Shreya, and, and uh, those of you involved in that effort here will, will understand, she credits the work of, which has been going on for much longer that, than uh, many of us have even existed for decades for community health workers around the world as part of the, the, the model. If you look at the models here in Philadelphia or in the state of Alaska, where I first learned about the model some almost 25 years ago, that, that those have been coming from abroad those ideas. So we're in a place now where that rule's in effect. It's got to be implemented, and that this is where it comes down to, um, I think many of you are doers or enabling doers. It's going to come down to actually implementing that rule, which went into effect uh, on January 1st. Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year. I want to turn more towards what you're excited about now, Raj, because I feel like you're one of these people who's always got a million things cooking. <sighs> Um, in terms of your interests, I know you so it's pasta most of the time, yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, you I know you have a lot of thoughts too on like how different sectors need to work together, and you know what what needs to change, or what do we need to strengthen, or build on, or what do we need to be taking advantage of, and you know, and I'm gonna make it broad to global health health equity here in the U.S. broadly. Well, look, I think there's two there's there's so many perennial challenges that, uh, that that we've all been working on here and around the world. I think the two that questions that that continue to make me curious and focused, one is how do we do better uh, the next time we have a pandemic? How do we prevent and prepare for the next pandemic? You mentioned a few of the, the policies and initiatives that the White House put out uh, both here and around the world. The American Pandemic Preparedness Plan calls for vaccines in 100 days of the next pandemic. That's a charge that is there for anyone here involved in biotech. How do we get there? It's, it's only- I was gonna ask, can you tell us when they're gonna do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, believe it or not, the FDA, CMS, uh, you know, the, 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 the CDC, uh, to their credit, have actually tried to, have taken, you know, and, and built this plan, uh, 16 federal agencies committed to it. Uh, there's also, for the first time, for those who are following in global health, since PEPFAR, Congress authorized a billion new dollars of funding. Uh, we still have to get PEPFAR reauthorization renewed, and that is a big fight that is absurd that we're still fighting these many years into program six, 25 million lives around the world. But Congress then put in, following the Ebola outbreak, some money that then went away after the emergency, except this time following COVID, has put in through the Global Health Security Act a billion dollars a year that can be spent by U.S. government dollars into health systems, really. It's not a disease-focused program. It's focused on global health security. So that's labs, it's health workers. And it has some flexibility built in the And the scale. Uh, you yeah. know, we went, yeah. most people, the U.S. was helping, you know, the, the, the central lesson, I think, of COVID is to protect us, we have to protect others. And that means vulnerable people in this country it means vulnerable people around the world. Omicron and Delta may or may not have happened had we gotten vaccinations to people earlier, especially the highest risk. But because it was late, it was more likely to occur. And think about how many people died uh, even after those, both here and around the world. So we've got to get those vaccines around the world, and part of it means building capacity in those countries. So we launched the Pandemic Fund at the World Bank, a $2 billion fund, uh, that's great, but it's still what we need is $10 billion of new money a year to really help other countries. And then we need a lot more done in this country to make sure we're prepared. So that's one. The second big question, and it comes back to this, this erosion of and setback in life expectancy, both here and around the world, worse since World War II. And many of the OECD countries have actually rebounded since COVID. The United States has not. And that has a lot to do with a number of complex factors. There's been some reporting in the Washington Post about this. Uh, New York City has put out some, some, I think, formidable programs. If you look at their programs, a lot of it is about that basic idea of meeting people where they are, bring care to people, don't wait to come to care, and they don't wait for them to come to care. And, and so I think that work has to continue here and around the world. And that, of course, is much more complicated than, than just preparing for a pandemic as complex as that activity is. But I think that's the other central work and agenda that we have to focus on. And let me ask you too, we're in the Bay Area, so I'm going to ask, is there a role for technology in that too? When I hear about, you know, preparedness and preventative, is there a role of AI? Is there, like, 
do you see a role for technology in all this? Or I guess maybe I should say what role. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you look at I think there's everybody on this earth wants modern healthcare. I think we could lose the audience. No. We just need to speak uh, into it like this. <laughs> Not like we're at. Not like we're so don't don't be pitiful. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, you'd like to make a TikTok video? Yeah. <laughs> <Do it after. laughs> so so yeah, I think there is a, a, a critical role. Here, here's a, the central reason why though. Uh, it's better from an outcomes perspective if you have an AI ultrasound at a midlife way out in the community. Uh, you know, door to door. As I've spent some of my time over the years. They've only been able to do, uh, you know, the, the cone on your on your uh, on the on the on the belly, um, and that's technology that's way out there. Uh, a, a mother should be able to have access to an ultrasound anywhere in the world. A child should be able to have access to uh, pulse oximetry when they have pneumonia anywhere in the world. They uh, uh, a adult that you know, a fifteen year old who broke his leg or had his leg shattered because a limb fell on it as one of our patients in my area did should be able to have a prosthetic uh, at, at the as well. So yeah, we're gonna need more investment. I think one of the things we've got to do more of, and, and you know, the lessons of COVID again are irrelevant here. Uh, it took it, it say to take the vaccine for a second. It took seventy six percent of the delay in getting that vaccine to low and middle countries, according to the IMF, was due to low and middle income countries or those procuring on their behalf being not being able to put in purchase orders with manufacturers at the beginning of the pandemic. So the rich countries, of course, did what actually constitutionally any one of them uh, should do, which is protect their people. They overordered. I think they will always do that because. You don't know which way a pandemic is going to go. And if you're actually responsible, you're going to order more than you need, as our president has said to me a couple of times. So in that scenario, we've got to get more creative about private-public partnerships. So uh, I think the FISA, Jimmy, there you are. One of our panelists earlier tonight. So you know, the FISA is, is and, and the work she's leading in health at the Development Finance Corporation, I would encourage you to look it up. Uh, is, is working through the federal government, also with G7 partners, to try to set up a essentially a, 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 a capital loan facility or a line of credit that would allow either low and middle income countries or their proxies to be able to put in purchase orders alongside rich countries on day zero of the pandemic. What will that do to protect others, to protect us, protect others? Here's how that applies here. That would allow companies making these products who need to have a commercial business to succeed and make new products to have a greater clarity about how much volume is going to be ordered. And that would mean allow they would be more clear with their investors how many manufacturing sites do they need to pick up, how many contracted company, how many com companies that do manufacturing do they need to outsource to with more reliability because they have the orders up front. Well, guess what? That's a win win for everybody. Because if you have higher volume of your product that's going to be bought by consumers, you can be persuaded to lower the price for each one of those products, which means Americans would win, and so would people around the world. That's the kind of creativity um, uh, that, that we need more of in, in this moment. And I think you know, it really means that you know, I think the Bay Area and the Bay Area Global Health Alliance uh, you know, it's really well positioned because if you look at the way the private and public sector and the social sector have to work here and the proximity you have from this geography. I, I know it's just the work of Emerson Collective. Um, that, that means the ideas need to come from places like this as much as they do from, from other parts of the world. And I think that's, it. we're going to shift to Q&A, but I think that's such an amazing point to pause on too, because I think even five, ten years ago, would we be talking so much about financing and global health? I think the conversations have evolved. We're looking at where are there problems, what can be done to solve them with these creative solutions. So, Rob, thank you. Um, I'd like to open it up for any questions from all of you. I know it's getting late in the evening, but you've got Raj here. Rashawn, so, has a question. 
Do we have a mic? Sorry. I'll speak loud. Okay, I'll um, repeat it if needed. So, one question that keeps coming back is how is this blueprint for preparedness? Conversation. Certainly, everybody in this room gets that. How, how exciting is that? But it's not translating down to the larger non health focused public to understand the connection between finance and the opportunity in the private sector innovation or any of the rest of it. There's a huge communications challenge to try to share both the opportunity and, um, and, and then the challenges that are ahead of, of us in population health in this country and, and, and around the world. And, and I, I said it's maybe even outside of your purview, but I'm kind of curious about you. How do you uh, disseminate these messages and raise the knowledge uh, boats of a larger portion of the population so that we get um, leaders uh, voting uh, for um, finance in the right place and we get populations understanding why this kind of emphasis is important? And, you know, maybe it's too big of a question. Well, I, I think it's an important one. Let, let me, you know, I was taught in school very well in the White House that only have opinions about your lane. So I will take your question and bring it into pandemic preparedness and get into your own reference. Although we have a pandemic preparedness plan that's older than it ever has been, right? These very clear time plans, cost of actually implementing that plan is more than what Congress has put out. So we did. The president made the largest request in history for pandemic preparedness in March 2022 to Congress. It was for $88 billion over five years to supercharge this plan. 70% uh, of the money was going to go to Health and Human Services, FDA, C the NIH, and others to actually be able to do the science and, and streamline the regulatory process to make that possible. The other, say, 30% was going to go to Department of Defense, State Department, USAID to do the global work, scale up to 50 countries, the, the work USAID and CDC do around the world to help uh, poor countries actually be able to stop threats at their source, like in Liberia. But Congress didn't go to that level. They instead are back to this incremental addition in the annual appropriations and annual budget. So, your point about communication is really critical. People understand when there's a pandemic, you would have, uh, you know, stimulus coming out of the federal government to put money into people's pockets and loss of jobs to fund vaccination sites like we're set up in this country around the world you can see and feel. But we've got to get better at helping people understand why financing 
preparedness is vital. And I think that means we have to start thinking like all of us did at the beginning of the pandemic. We have very simple questions. If there's a new novel pathogen, the advice I'm getting on the TV that my local health department is telling me, that my doctor or nurse is telling me, is that correct advice? Is it informed by science? If I get symptoms, am I going to get tested quickly enough? If I test positive, will I get a treatment quickly enough? Once a vaccine is available, will it keep me safe, at least keep me out of the hospital if not for the transmission? That's what's at stake when Congress says, no, we're not going to finance this at $88 million for five years. And, and I think that's where we still have, I couldn't agree with you more, a lot more work to do to persuade Congress. It actually... Not only is that relevant for the American public, the private sector has, has a tremendous windfall for that, that money to come out because a lot of the biotech industry, uh, whether you're a test maker, a device maker, a treatment manufacturer, or uh, working in R&D for vaccines, it's a risk-heavy business to try to prepare for a pandemic. You know, when it's going to come, if it comes, you're not sure if you're going to have enough patients that are going to want to buy your test of what's happening with COVID tests in this country huge demand and then all of a sudden it crashed. Um, and so you've got to de-risk that investment. Well, where was the de-risk investment going to come from? It's going to come in part from public dollars, which taxpayers have to support. So we've got to ask our mayors, our state leaders, our congressional leaders to get behind these initiatives. Because in the end, the answers to those questions I just laid out depend on whether or not we act now, not later. Great. Uh, one more. We'll do one more, oh, yeah. Ones, yeah. I'm hearing all that you pick. <laughs> but oh, Roger will be around here after too. Yeah. So to link those questions in your answer, um, what role could a new and improved priority review voucher program play to say it again more time? A new and improved priority review yeah. voucher program. So instead of saying we'll have something ready a hundred days later, right? We could have something a hundred days before. And then you're not relying, relying on public sector funding. You're relying on the market to transferability of the voucher to pay for it. Yeah, yeah. And, and we we don't do a good job at all of refreshing the list of pathogens on that list. Agreed. Agreed. So why don't? Maybe that's something this room can start to solve too. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Oh, but I would, does that mean I don't get an answer? Oh, no. we have someone over here that can help do that. Okay, see this? I like this. It's like auctioning. We're volunteering people who are going to solve major health challenges. Uh, Raj, what do you I think those need to, yeah, I, I think that that is, is, is an absolutely vital right. point. That, that work's got to happen. Uh, you know, much, the, 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 a response to a pandemic is only going to be as good as the systems that are dealing with these issues day in and day out. So I think conceptually you're right. I mean, obviously this is something that, that HHS will pay more attention to, but it's it's not, I don't think we're where we need to be at the moment. So I'm happy to have an offline conversation about that as well. Yeah. Do you have a quick comment? Yeah. yeah sure. Um, you're being hey, for us. Ball, ball, ball. Oh. <laughs> so my name's Darshak. Um, I just wanted people to be aware, and I have a question for Raj. Um, at the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health or ARPA, a new HHS agency, just yesterday, JP Morgan, we announced actually a pay for success model for public health in the US. It's a, over, you know, over $100 million dedicated towards advanced purchasing public health outcomes in the United States in one of four areas. So the idea is to create a business case fundamentally to catalyze uh, payment and rewards for improving health of Americans in a way that we have done before. Um, actually, like, I, I'm surrounded by like, colleagues here who are like, super smart on this topic and who have like, helped develop this concept. So my question is, first of all, um, I just want people to be aware, but also if you could target a, a couple of outcomes for Americans at geographic scale, what do you think would be the most important ones, picking like two or three, if we could put a couple hundred millions behind that, which, to be clear, we can. <laughs> I was going to ask. <laughs> Since it's the DFC group sitting over there. Yeah. Well, I, 
you know what it is. It's not EFT though. It's a different part. Yeah, you're, you're asking all about. EFT, like the power Influential power. people. <laughs> <laughs> um, number one, mental health. Uh, you know, the more we could do to screen people earlier for conditions, to be able to reach populations that aren't staying in therapy, that aren't staying in treatment. And you should just look around the corner. I actually, the first time I ever did outreach in this country was here in San Francisco, and uh, it's with with unhoused people here. And 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 that's a that's a critical issue. Uh, um, number two, uh, you know, chronic disease uh, management, whether it's obesity related, cardiovascular disease. It's great to hear about at the, at the JPM comments about GLP one uh, uh, molecules. And one of the questions I'm asking is, I imagine that you might be. Is, Okay, how do we get that to the people who are at highest risk for obesity and then the poor cardiovascular outcomes that are associated with it and aren't likely to get GLP-1 medicines now? So I think funding delivery innovations, and there are plenty around the country, uh, a lot of them do have proactive outreach in one form or another in multidisciplinary teams. I think, I think scaling those is critical. Uh, so those to me come are are, are top of mind. Um, I I think the, the you know the, the, those those are those are probably the most important. I think that the third area is if you look at complex care for people with polychronic diseases that are I think the group of people in the country that are using and reusing hospitals, emergency rooms, and I'm not saying anything new here. But I do think what's new is, uh, it, because some of the reforms have happened in recent years, is you've got companies like the Company Health, you know, run by my friend Rahul Rajkumar, some of you know, uh, that kind of company needs more capital to scale up. Uh, Impact, uh, which is a B Corp that, that Shreya Kondoli spun out of Philadelphia after helping many uh, health organizations, countries train and recruit community health workers. That kind of big organization also needs that kind of capital. They should be a conference. Well, thank you all for the very, very good questions. Um, I'm going to hand, well, first of all, let me thank you, Raj. Thank you. I know it's really, thank you. Thank you, Sarah, to wrap this up. I just wanted to thank Krista and Raj. Thank you so much. Um, and to Accenture for um, loaning the space. And thank you, Natasha. And for our wonderful speakers um, earlier at the J.P. Morgan panel, Michonne, Nafisa, and Ken, um, and Raj again, and Krista again, um, you can tell that we have some real stars here. This is a very inspiring group of people. All of you are. And I would ask you to spend the next 30 minutes getting to know each other. Talk about your, your work. Talk about the Alliance. We're a community. And we, I think the more that we can do together and build that trust and build that community, the more we'll be able to go externally and really make a bigger impact. So please meet each other, eat food, drink wine. I also wanted to um, thank a few people internally. First, Dayton um, Millstone is around here somewhere. And I just wanted to thank you. Panel together and bring this Lisa for being persistent with the um, JP Morgan uh, for a couple of years to finally get us there, and all of our board members. And if all of our board members could just raise your hand, so if anybody has any questions or anything like that, come to any of us and we'd be happy to answer any question. And without further ado, and with much gratitude for all of you for coming out tonight on a very rainy San Francisco. I feel like we're in California and we we're supposed to have nice weather. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I just want to thank all of you for being part of it, for the work that you do. Again, you guys are an inspiring group, and I look forward to getting to know all of you at some point. So thank you.